Hello, my name is Gene Montristelli, and I am the editor of TappingQ&A.com, and the video that you are about to watch is an interview that I did as part of the 24 Hours of Tapping. The 24 Hours of Tapping was a free event, which was a fundraiser for the Peaceful Heart Network. The Peaceful Heart Network provides training and trauma relief tools to those in war-torn countries, as well as working with refugees all over the world. They've been able to help out over 200,000 people all over the world. After you watch this video, if you find this video something that was useful, the very easy way that you can say thank you to the guests for giving their time and sharing their expertise is to go to 24HoursOfTapping.com slash support and make a small contribution to support the Peaceful Heart Network. Again, that is 24HoursOfTapping.com slash support, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Naomi is an accredited master EFT trainer and mentor for evidence-based EFT and EFT International. She works with clients from all over the world in her private practice and runs training workshops for practitioners in Australia and the United States. In addition to practice training and mentoring, Naomi works to further the cause of tapping along with mindfulness and meditation through a number of channels. She is the creator of Remindfulness, an app listed in 2017 by Positive Psychology as the top 10 app for mindfulness, as well as the writer and co-producer of the documentary, The Science of Tapping. Please welcome to our virtual stage, Naomi. Hello. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me here. Absolutely. So just I, I'm loving to give people a little context. Where do we find you in the world and what time of day is it actually for you right now? It's almost 7 p.m. Excellent. And, um, I'm hearing a little echo, by the way. Can you hear? No, it's nope. good now. Yeah, nope. it's good now. I'm I'm about two hours drive south of Sydney. Yep. And in, in this beautiful, beautiful area called the Southern Highlands, which is sort of a country, beautiful rural area. And um, it's uh, been beautiful weather today. We've had a lot of rain for the last few months. So everyone's in a good mood around me. Awesome. And you do not sound like a native. Um, new, new, new. I might have been here 13 years, but they told me that you have to be third generation to be um, considered native. In this, uh, in this, I understand. <laughs> I I'm nowhere near being a real New Yorker, and it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And I've just come to accept that particular fact. But um, my so mother is question. Australian, so I am sort of. A, my mother is Australian, so I am part Australian. So excellent. Um, so one of the things that I've been asking folks at the top of these conversations is their origin story, not their tapping origin story, but their origin mm -hmm. story around the topic that we're going to be talking about in our little conversation. And so how did you find your way to trying to deal with painful memories and thinking about shortcut ways to doing that? Kind of like what was the, the birth of the framework that we're going to get a chance to talk about today? Well, like you said, I'm a trainer. And so I'm yep. always looking for ways to, um, to, to not just sort of teach EFT because mm -hmm. I train practitioners, but I also train people who don't want to be pr practitioners to just right. kind of learn how to do it better. So I'm always kind of looking for ways to not just teach it, but to have it be understood. And one thing that I noticed was that and I'm sure you've had this happen as, as a practitioner yourself, mm -hmm. um, that you'll have people come back to you to work on something or come to you right. for the first time to work on something that they have, uh, that they've done a lot of tapping. It might even be another practitioner and yep. they, they, they want to work on something new. And within 10 minutes of the session, they're saying, Oh my God, it's going back to that again. Yep. You know, and it's like, and you kind of go, well, what's that? And say, oh, well, it's, you know, this issue from my childhood that, um, oh my, I've done so much tapping on it. I can't even, I can't believe it's still there. I've like done 10 years of tapping. I thought it was all taken care of. Yeah. So that was one of the things. The other thing is that uh, sort of classic EFT involves having people, um, you know, tune into a memory, what happened and what's your particular, uh, what aspect are you thinking of right now? And what's the emotion and, do you, yep. you know, do you, where do you feel that in your body? Right. So we've all had people who say, I don't feel emotion. 
Mm -hmm. you know, or they go, um, this uh, really outrageous thing happened, but I have absolutely no reaction to it at all. But I think it probably should have given me rea a reaction. I can think about it clearly. I can talk about it, et cetera. Right. No emotion, no triggering. So um, I kind of stumbled on this by accident because I was working with a client who couldn't, didn't have any emotions. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I know to kind of go carefully with that because it's yeah. probably dissociation and so on. And like you were saying earlier, I think with Mitch, you were talking about sort of being specific and yeah. how I find there are just so many wonderful ways to apply tapping. And there's like a spectrum. And and at the general end, you've got sort of the gentle techniques, which create this distancing to keep somebody safe while you approach something really maybe traumatic in a gentle, safe way. Yep. Um, and, and group tapping, for example. And then you've got at the other end of the spectrum, really specifically focusing on the nitty gritty of what happened, what's the emotion and, and where do you feel it and so on and processing that. Um, this comes under the heading of that end of the spectrum, but it's even further over because what I discovered was that I would say to somebody, well, don't focus on the emotion then just focus on what happened. And now tell me what you remember about what happened. So mm -hmm. I would pick out the aspects. So yep. anybody watching this that doesn't know, you know, the aspects, five of those are sensory aspects. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you see, smell, hear, taste, uh, kinesthetically feel and so on. And not all of those sensory um, aspects belong to every memory, but um, you kind of have to ask yep. about them or a lot of times they won't surface. And I found that asking if there was an emotion, some people just said, well, I don't have an emotion and they get kind of confused and they, they might even find themselves getting, um, feeling like they weren't doing it right. So, yeah. uh, so I said, well, why don't you just focus on how clearly you remember that visual? Okay. You know, so the person was say, oh, I can do that. I can. And so I said, out of 10, how clearly can you remember the visual of, you know, maybe they were working on a, um, a memory of um, seeing an argument between their parents. So how clearly can you, what, what stands out to you? And they might say, well, uh, and I would scan the five senses, what stands out the most? I might say, well, the visual of, you know, gesturing, you know, while they were arguing. And mm -hmm. so then I would say, how clearly can you see that out of 10? And the person said, oh, it's like eight out of 10. And it might've been mm -hmm. a memory from when they were five years old, this person's, you know, in their fifties and that's pretty significant that they can vividly see that. Yep. So um, I just tapped, even though I can clearly see this, I deeply and completely accept myself and just had them focus on that aspect, mm -hmm. not worry about emotions, not worry about thoughts, not worry about any somatic sense of, how does your body react when you look at that? Mm -hmm. And what I found was that it collapsed really cleanly, efficiently, and quickly. And sometimes in the process of working on it like that, emotion would come up suddenly for the person, you know, when I subsequently tried this with different people, yeah. suddenly there would be emotion where the person said, well, I don't have any emotion. And I started to get this sort of picture that emotions and thoughts are encoded in these sensory aspects. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to focus on the thoughts or the emotion while you tap on just the clarity of the memory of that sensory aspect. Mm -hmm. And um, it's quicker because, you know, with EFT, every time the emotion changes, you do the setup statement again, you know, yeah. classic sort of clinical yeah. EFT. And what I found is that um, you didn't have to restart the setup statement every time because you were just focusing on the clarity of it. Yeah. And the more that I started to experiment with it, the more that I found that it was fast, but without losing the benefit that you get from being specific. Yeah. And it's interesting as you say that you're like talking about, I'm trying going in through the clarity and I'm finding all of these other aspects, like pieces of it. It, it. It's silly example. 
I was trying to think of an actress's name earlier this week. And the moment I got her last name, her entire IMDB thing showed up in my head. Like it was like, I just, I just needed to find one thing clearly, which was the last name. And it was the doorway. That just went, and I found yeah. all of the things inside of there. And I, and I could see the exact same thing because like when I think of my third grade classroom there, initially there's absolutely no emotion to it until I start seeing the details and, Oh, there's the teacher and there's the flag. And there is the, and all of a sudden I was like, Oh, this is what it feels like to be in third grade where that was nowhere near the surface. You said, how do you feel when you were a third grader? I'm like, I don't know. I was third grade, but by having one little thing, doorway a pinhole to look through i can see how quickly it is that we get access to it and like you're saying we don't have to consciously have to have access to it just as we're engaging right. with it in a tapping way the magic of that tapping thing just grabs the whole thing and goes great i'm going after all of this even if you're not consciously aware of all of that that's exactly right and what what you're consciously aware of is um usually you know, one of the big problems when we're doing sort of regular EFT is that when people start focusing on emotions, they can globalize pretty quickly, which, yeah. you know, if, if they're if they're having anger in the memory of something that happened when they were um, eight years old, but they have anger about a lot of different events in their childhood. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly we're, you know, tabletop tapping. We're globalizing. We don't mean to, but it's like we're right. tapping into an underground spring. And it makes really hard to get that sort of laser effect. And what I found with this is that because you're just focusing on the sensory experience, the conscious mind's sort of rehearsed stories about, you know, this is the emotion or this is the thought and the global stuff. Yeah. It doesn't even come into, I mean, it gets processed without the conscious mind wading into the, into the, the tapping yeah. And, and I can see that being super valuable because often, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this with your clients as well, oftentimes our conscious mind will have a coherent explanation as to why we are the way that we are that has nothing to do with why we are the way that we are. Like I, I learned this lesson. I had, a, yeah, I had a client who came to me and she's like, I'm afraid of speaking in public because when I was in third grade at show and tell, I brought my guinea pig. It got away at Rand and everybody laughed at me. And that's the reason why I'm afraid of public speaking. Well, it turned out it's because the boss was in the room. It had nothing to do with his memory. <laughs> but because like as a species, we have survived because our effectiveness to be able to create cause and effect stories, to be able to navigate things. I see big footprints. I know there's a fuzzy thing with giant teeth. I'm going this direction. Oh, the moss is growing on this side of the rock. Therefore, we can harvest over here this time of year. Like we're really good at that until we're not. Until because we now have to have an answer to it. And so I can see the elegance of this is being able to bypass the notoriously poor eyewitness that we are to our own experience. <laughs> I love that. The notoriously poor eyewitness. It is, and and what what happens with the, as you know, the unconscious has a whole different story about why yep. something is important, and especially kind of the more work people have done, whether it's in in therapy, talk therapy, or or other tapping work, or um, just self inquiry, self help, so on. People kind of self diagnose. You know, they kind of go, yeah. "Well, I've worked out that I have an issue where you know I I I don't trust authority figures." You know, and then mm -hmm. they kind of bring that story. And what I love about this is it doesn't require it get it gets past all of that, and you don't even have to. Um, well, something that happens with this with this process is that someone might say. Uh, they, they might bring a, a memory that has some emotional intensity to it. Because yep. I do this like 60% of the time now. Um, no. it's, it's, they have a memory that has emotional intensity. And then by the time we've tapped down the sensory clarity of it, I will, it'll be down to maybe, maybe it started at a nine and it'll come down to about a, a five or something like mm -hmm. that. And they'll say, I can still see it pretty clearly, but I don't have any emotion anymore. And mm -hmm. what I'll say is the fact that you can still see it clearly means yeah. it's still relevant to some somewhere in the body. And yeah. I've had people kind of like, oh, OK, well, if you want to waste my time, I guess we'll keep tapping. <laughs> so yeah. We keep going a little bit and then it drops halfway through the round. They go, this new emotion came up. Yeah. And it's it's um, it's just it's it just so speaks only to the body. 
And I think, yeah. you know, it's like we have this triune brain, prefrontal cortex, limbic system, and the, the primitive brain. I think coaching and talk therapy and CBT and things like that are like appeal to the, the prefrontal cortex, the conscious mm -hmm. mind. I think the kind of tapping when we're talking about emotions and things, which is very valuable too, you know, I'm not saying that isn't, it's like the limbic system because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of, you know, memory and putting that all together and understanding, you know, how things are all relevant. But I think that at the level of just the body, sort of the, the reptile brain, there is an experiential kind of component that the language spoken by that part of your body is yeah. the language of visual memory, auditory. In fact, if I'm tapping with someone on an auditory memory, I don't, if they say, you know, my my third grade teacher said, you know, you'll never amount to anything. I don't repeat that. I have them play the audio in their mind while we tap. Yeah. Because I want them really, really, you know, tuning into that. And what I found is that clients who had, you know, the aforementioned, oh, my God, here's this thing again. I ask them now, can you remember vividly mm -hmm. what happened? Oh, yeah, I can. Absolutely. And I go. So you've done a lot of great work on it, but now let's yep. go and do the last bit. Let's go do this somatic bit, the, the sensory part. And I found that when something collapses this way, like it's amazing. It doesn't matter where in the world they are, where, what the cultural background is. Visuals will start to pixelate, blur, seem further away yeah. and get darker. There's like four things that happen to visuals. Yeah. And so there's these kinds of, different ways that the the sensory things it's like the unconscious starts to kind of go oh i guess this isn't happening anymore yeah and so it kind of goes into deep storage or it just kind of becomes less important but i also let people know if you have a memory that you consciously don't want to lose you won't because you get to decide it's just yeah. that yeah if it's got and, no and, 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 and it, it and, and it's so funny you mentioned that like I actually had that come up this week with a client where the, it, it was something it was there was some trauma related to a memory, not their memory being traumatic. And the client was and this is my earliest memory. And so I don't want to lose my earliest memory. And I'm like, great write it down, take a snapshot of it. Like we cannot, we can do it in a way where we're not losing the historical details of what happened without having to have this underlying layer of the meaning and the story and the stuff that is yeah. there. I, you know, I, one of my, one of my just kind of favorite tools, like you want to go clear out a bunch of crap is the country that you lived in when you were 13 years old, go get the top 100 music from that time period and that place and just hit play and all the feels are going to show up in the middle of your chest. You know, I was, I was, I was listening to, I, there's a, there's a podcast that I listen to that's about the history of the charts and all of that sort of stuff. And I can remember walking through the neighborhood and this Phil Collins song came on and oh my gosh, was I 12 years old all of a sudden? And oh my gosh, could I feel all that stuff? But it's possible for me to release all of that stuff. And that song still exists in the world. I can still listen yeah. to it. I can still enjoy it. And the memory is the exact same way. Is I can take this kind of gut punch of teenage angst out of the song without losing my enjoyment of the song and without losing the memories of being that age. And so yeah. I think it's good for us to be able to pre-frame that with clients sometimes because when they've had the experience of like, oh my gosh, I can't even remember what was there for things that are really rough, there are times that they don't want that. And to be able to say and name that, hey, we can actually hold on to these memories by just remembering it. That's right. We strip out, we strip out all the bad in terms of the bad feelings. And I tell people, mm -hmm. you know, tapping doesn't make you stupid. If something happened to you that was really terrible, you're you're gonna know it's terrible. Like you're right. not gonna forget. It's just like if you heard somebody else say this happened to me, you would go, Oh, I'm so sorry, that's terrible. And yeah. so you'll still have that awareness that it was a bad thing, but you won't have any of the triggering anymore. Yeah. And and the the results that I've seen, I mean, there was one client in particular who had a lot of childhood trauma, done a lot, a lot of work on it. This was um, someone who had um, been tapping for many, many, many years mm -hmm. and had, had had great results, had great results with it. That's why, you know, she was very involved in tapping and, and did lots of tapping. And when I took this approach, in fact, I had worked with this person probably seven or eight years ago. And then mm -hmm. when I, when I, when I took this approach, a lot, there was some, some major health issues that changed within mm -hmm. the 
I mean, we, we still had to kind of work gently because these traumas, the edge was taken off, but had been by a prior work, but we still had to go carefully um, and use the gentle techniques even within this. And, yep. but once, once we cleared these down so that all of the aspects and it took, you know, three or four sessions just to clear one memory that she had never fully accessed before that was kind yeah. of representative of a lot of these memories. Yep. Um, a big physical issue went away. Hmm. Um, a major physical issue. So yeah. uh, I was, the, I started going, I'm, I'm going to play with this some more. Yeah. And just experiment. And so I've done that a lot and I've taught it to my students and said, give this a try, especially if they're having trouble doing sensory aspects. And yep. I see with their, with their practice clients over and over, they're just kind of working on thoughts and emotions, thoughts and emotions, thoughts and emotions. I'll say, okay, for your next couple of clients, I want you to only work with sensory aspects and just give mm -hmm. that a try and see what happens. Cause yep. you're still working on the thoughts and emotions. Yep. Like a metaphor that I give is like, if you're, if you're driving down the road, you're looking out the front, the windshield at mm -hmm. the road ahead. But you can still tell that there's cows going by here and that's a barn right. and, you know, and so on. Um, what you see out the front, that's the sensory aspect you're working on. And thoughts and emotions are what going by. So I say to people, allow yourself to feel that by all means, just like you're not trying to draw like the blinds down on the side windows yeah. of your car. And, but the problem is often if you turn and look at the cow, you might drive off the road. And that's what often happens with tapping is with the globalizing. Right. So keep focused on the sensory aspect you're working on and just let all that stuff process in, in, in the, well, the background, but out the side. Yeah. yeah. So would it be appropriate for us to give this a try? I would love to. Excellent. So, so, so right. you know, so, so we are, we're, we're now like 17 hours into this and I've been tapping all day <laughs> and I knew that we were going to be doing this. And yep. so I do you have one. I had it set aside and I've made sure that with all the tapping that we have been doing it. leading up, I haven't touched it <laughs> because I knew we were going to be having this conversation. So I've saved it just for this moment. All right, let's go. So you've got a memory that's pretty vivid. Have you? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Is it something, cause I, I mentioned you don't even have to, you know, say out, out loud what it is if you don't want, but you can also, it works just as well either way. So it was me communicating very, very poorly with someone I did not know very well. And mm -hmm. I was very much in the wrong in the way that I showed up. And there's a mm -hmm. huge amount of embarrassment that goes along with that. Okay. So have you tapped on this before? I have not. Oh, you haven't. Okay. So how long ago was this? Um, Five years ago. Five years. Okay. So what you want to do so this, this these are the steps um the first thing that you want to do is rate its rate the clarity out of 10 the vividness the clarity of that memory yeah it's nine a nine okay now i want you to rate the sort of the effect it has on you this is where we would say what's the intensity um like a seven okay all right so now when you scan this memory mm -hmm. From the sensory point of view, is there yeah. a particular aspect in terms of a visual, a smell, a taste, a sound? A yeah, yeah, thing? yeah. It's New York subway system, and yes, I can smell it. Okay, you can smell it out of <laughs> ten. So now, and here's another little pointer: yeah. remove all the other sensory parts of it. So yep. you're just focusing on the smell. Yeah, it's like this an is, eight. This is definitely divide and conquer. Okay, cool. Side of the hand. Even though I can smell this really clearly. Even though I can smell this really clearly. I deeply and completely accept myself. I deeply and completely accept myself. And does it help you tune in if I say this New York subway smell or are you already tuned in? Enough? I'm all the way there. Yeah, we don't need to name it. Like we don't need a title. The smell does it. Okay. And I deeply and completely accept myself. And I deeply and completely accept myself. Even though I can smell this. Even though I can smell this. I deeply and completely accept myself. I deeply and completely accept myself. Okay, top of the head. This smell. This smell. Eyebrow. This smell. This smell. Side of the eye, this smell. This smell. Under the eye, just tuning into the smell. This smell. Under the nose. Don't have to do anything with it. This smell. Just smelling the smell. 
Just smelling the smell. Just noticing how clearly I remember this smell. Just noticing how clearly I remember this smell. Just focusing on this smell. Just focusing on this smell. And one more time through the top of the head, this smell. The smell. The eyebrow really trying to smell it. The smell. Side of the eye, this smell. The smell. Under the eye, this really specific smell. This really specific smell. Under the nose, this smell. The smell. Under the mouth, the smell from this memory. The smell from this memory. Collarbone, this smell. This smell. Tuning into this smell. This smell. Okay. Now, reaccess it. It was an eight out of 10. Has it become clearer, which sometimes happens when you tune in more when you start tapping? Is it about the same? Is it less or is it different in some way? It's it's about the same, but and I don't know if this is useful or not. But as we were tapping through that, yeah. like it, it felt like I was like trying to expel something from my throat, and not like throwing up, but it was kind of uh -huh. like this this thing that like was stuck right here that was not associated with like like it's like I have a horrible gag reflex, so it's not the I smelled something bad gag. It was something mm -hmm. completely different than that. But just mm -hmm. as we were tuning into the smell and tapping, it was just all right here, just showed up out of nowhere. If we were in a proper session, I would have you focus on that next. And yep. then I'd get you into a semi tapping trance that would, so your conscious mind would get bored and wander off. And then I would hit you with, when have you felt that exact same feeling before in yep. your life? And then yep. we would work on another specific memory. Yep. So but, um, staying on this one, then it's bringing something up, obviously, just mm -hmm. focusing on that. So even though I have this remaining clarity, even though I have this remaining clarity of this really specific smell of this really specific smell from this memory, from this memory. And now I'm having this feeling in my throat at the same time. And now I'm having this feeling in my throat at the same time. I'm just going to let myself feel whatever I feel. I'm just going to let myself feel whatever I feel. While I really focus on this smell memory. While I really focus on the smell memory. And I deeply and completely accept myself. I deeply and completely accept myself. Top of the head. Just focusing on this smell. This smell. <sighs> this smell. Eyebrow. This smell. This smell. Side of the eye. Doing my best to smell it. Doing my best to smell it. Under the eye, to remember this smell. To remember this smell. Under the nose, really tuning into the smell from this memory. Really tuning into the smell. Under the mouth, the smell from this memory. The smell from this memory. Bone, tuning into this smell. Tuning into the smell. Under the arm, letting myself feel and think whatever comes up. Letting myself feel and think whatever comes up. Top of the head, while I focus on this smell. Well, I focus on this smell. Okay, check in now. Do your best to access that smell. Anything change about it? So the smell is basically gone, and mm -hmm. the visuals that are associated with it have gone yep. two-dimensional. Okay, so, so it's, I it's no longer this three-dimensional memory, but it's almost like a magazine photo of the person in the subway station, but okay. there's distance from it and there's no smell that's there at all in the memory. So taking that into consideration, and that actually is, I have heard somebody say before, it it collapses and becomes like a, a, a two-dimensional photo. That is something yeah. I actually, so taking that into consideration, mm -hmm. out of 10, rate the clarity of that visual. Uh, three. Okay, side of the hand. Even though I have this remaining clarity. Even though I have this remaining clarity. And the visual has gone two-dimensional. And the visual has gone two-dimensional. All I have to do is notice that. All I have to do is notice that. And I deeply and completely accept myself. And I deeply and completely accept myself. And I often just don't do the setup statement more than once. This visual. This visual. Eyebrow. Noticing every detail. Noticing every detail. Side of the eye. Just noticing what I can see. Just noticing what I can see. Under the eye. Not trying to do anything with this. Not trying to do anything with this. Under the nose. Just notice what I can see. Just notice what I can see. Under the mouth. This visual from this memory. This visual from this memory. All around. Letting myself feel and think whatever comes up for me. 
letting me feel and think whatever comes up for me. Under the arm while I focus on this remaining visual. While I focus on this remaining visual. Top of the head. This remaining visual memory. This remaining visual memory. Okay, stop and take a deep breath. What did you know? So, yeah, so it happened. So the instant we started tapping on the side of the hand, yeah. it was almost like the like a special effect where the image just starts dissolving and like going off in different directions. And uh -huh. the thing that I immediately went to was, so the second part of this interaction was a frantic text exchange once I'd taken the subway back to the neighborhood. And so once that picture disintegrated, I yeah. was no longer in lower Manhattan. I was now at the subway station in Brooklyn. And so okay. it was like, the, so there was like the, the embarrassment from the initial reaction evaporated wow the, that's amazing the frantic like trying to recover from that embarrassment and the emotion of ah oh, desperately trying to make something right is the thing that we found next which was just at the other end of the subway line but as i think about that initial thing like uh -huh. i can see it but there's no charge to it at all so when you say you can see it and there's no charge to it how clearly can you see it like kind of like i i could like i can see it because I know that I know the city hall subway stop. Like, it's not like I'm, I'm re like, it's like I'm remembering a place I've been before. I see, I'm not right, remembering this. Yeah. Because I, I can't like, I can't forget what that, like you said, like we don't forget these things. I can't forget the, like, I can't forget what the person looks like. I can't yes. forget what that space looks like, but it's not the memory of that. It's just like, Oh, this is what that person looks like. Oh, this is what the city hall subway stop looks like. Oh, this is what it looks like if that person was standing there. So go back to that memory right now as if you're still standing there. So what I tell people to do is just to make, put themselves, put yourself in the version of you that was in that experience. Yeah. And looking out of the eyes of you, you can't really see anything that you haven't seen a million times. No. Yeah. Is, can you hear anything? Like what I would hear in the subway station, but it's not the memory of that moment. I just, it's like it. It, it's just it's just the generic sound of the steel wheels in a subway station. Like we're getting to the sense of globalization that you were talking about. Like yes. when I think of the inside of a New York subway station, that's yeah. the sound that is in my head everywhere in the system. So it's not like yes. that memory. It's just there. Yeah. And and so then we go back to the level of sort of just emotional intensity for that whole event, yeah. which was, I think, a seven out of ten. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and when I had that seven, it was only the front end of the memory. It wasn't there. There was no emotion to the back of the memory because I didn't access it. There's no emotion to the front end of the memory and cool. all of the emotion exists in Brooklyn. None of it exists in Manhattan. So then you would just do the exact second, same right. thing with part two. Yep. Absolutely. And just, just scan. And um, what I found with this too, is that, um, you know, this weird paradoxical thing with tapping that, you know, if you had, um, let's say um, 35 almost identical traumatic experiences as mm -hmm. a child and you tap on one of them really specifically, it's that whole um, generalization effect. But mm -hmm. what I've found is that working this way seems to supercharge the generalization effect. Yeah. There's something about going down to the nitty gritty of the sensory experience the the sensory aspects that mm, the unconscious kind of really buys in that this isn't happening anymore and just yeah. goes well if, if this one isn't happening anymore because you know the, the these traumatic memories by their nature the unconscious thinks they're still happening right because there's no sense of time back there so when you've actually collapsed one of these in this really thorough way all the way down to when it's like i stop when it's like a two each aspect mm -hmm. yep um and when you've done that then it's like often the person, if they were similar enough kinds of experiences, can't really think of. They know more happened, but they can't really think about it and they don't care about it anymore. Yeah. So it just shows by being so laser specific, you can kind of knock out a whole bunch of sort of yeah. related events. That's awesome. And so, so 
there is like, and, and you've, you've, you've glanced off this as we've had the conversation here, but I'd love for you to speak to it specifically. The mm -hmm. difference between trying to do this sort of work in a group versus trying to do this sort of work with an individual and this particular tool or anything else as you like, because, you know, like just because we can, doesn't mean we should. And yeah. like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always trying to err on the side of safety and protect the people around me. And if that means we're going slow. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about approaching something like this in a group versus one-on-one, -on -one, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, anytime you do any kind of tapping, you, like I started at the beginning, there are degrees of clarity, the de yep. degrees of specificity. So you have to make sure that that's um, uh, appropriate to what you're working on. And anybody who's watching this that goes, oh, cool, I want to try this on a memory. Um, absolutely do not do this with trauma. You shouldn't do any mm. tapping on trauma yourself anyway. Yep. You should be yes. with a practitioner. So full stop. Preach, preach, preach. Say preach, that again. Yeah. We got to hear that. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and so... And so I think actually to do this in a, in a, a group, group tapping by its very nature is very positive and very general. Mm -hmm. I just, you just have to keep it that way, you know, to yeah. keep people safe. And so um, I would say to anybody who wants to try this on their own, that you pick a memory that's not very intense. You pick a memory sort of like the one you just described, like, yep. please don't pick trauma um, yep. no matter how tempting it is, do not pick trauma. Um, and pick a, 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 an event that I would say the intensities, you can easily remember it without the discomfort level being over like an eight. Yeah. You know, do you think that's kind of probably a good. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And, 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 you know, like the instruction that you gave me when you said, oh, I want to do a demo. Can you think of something? You said somewhere between five to seven. And yeah. that was like, that was perfect guidance for me Good. to find this thing. Like it was a thing that every time I thought of this thing, I was like, God, I was such a jackass <laughs> in that particular scenario. But it wasn't something that I was losing sleep over that was preventing me from like moving forward in my life and that sort of stuff. It was just like, boy, I really wasn't my best self for this particular person. And that was really unfortunate. And so yeah. that's a really, really good piece of guidance in, in doing it in that particular way. I like that. Yeah. And, and everybody's got to be really responsible for and realize how powerful a, a, the second you start tapping on yourself, no matter which way you're yeah. doing it, you can drop into something intense. You've got to appreciate how potent EFT is. Don't underestimate it. Better, yeah. better be safe. And, and it's so, yeah, as, as you say that, and like, it's like the biggest difference between me and, you know, past Gene 16 years ago is like how much slower I go tapping on my own, tapping with my clients as individuals, as groups, and just going, we don't got to like, we don't got to be in a rush. And, you know, I've, I've said it a dozen times in the last 14 hours. Like I'm so excited as a community, like people just don't talk about one minute miracles anymore, or we do it very, very rarely. And I think that it, that is such like in the beginning, I'd say, Oh, I want to show you this really cool thing. Look how awesome, look how magic it is. Now that we are so much more well-formed as a community, we're like, I'm going to err on the side of safety because if I'm not keeping someone safe, it doesn't matter how fast this particular tool is and so like your, your guidance on this is like total agreeance on this side of the screen about that sort of stuff it's so important that we hear that as we step into this yeah and i say to people about the one minute miracles i said look I, you know they happen you might be you know people win lotteries too yeah because <laughs> you know? i don't want to get in the way of you having one of those you know being one of those one in a million people that has the one minute miracle they happen, but it's absolutely not the norm. It's not to be expected. And um, it can get in the way of you getting the really powerful, thorough uh, effects and clearing and healing with EFT if you give up on it when you haven't given it enough time. Yeah, and, and one of the, and I think the thing that like, I've come to understand the reason why we have those different experiences is like, there's, there's two different ways that trauma happens. There's trauma that happens when we're in a state of safety and there's trauma that happens when we're in a state of unsafety. You know, I'm, I'm camping with my family. I'm having a good time. Someone throws a rubber snake in my sleeping bag. I'm now afraid of snakes, but I'm generally in a safe space inside of that. And so typically that's going to be something that's going to clear very, very quickly. Mm. Where if I'm in a circumstance where I'm in a house with an unpredictable parent that is bipolar, that is alcoholic, 
alcoholic where I can act the exact same way three days in a row and my parental unit gives me three completely different responses. So I'm constantly on guard and on edge. Something significantly smaller than a snake being thrown into my sleeping bag can happen. But because mm. of the state that I am in, it could take significantly longer for me to unmesh that thing. So it's not even about the size of the trauma. It's the context that it's happening within. And as a practitioner, I have an idea of that concept, but I don't know what your experience was. Yes. And when we have someone who is not well-formed as a practitioner who's navigating this stuff, like trauma is not trauma is not trauma. Like there is, you know, every color under the rainbow and the way we approach it and the speed and the efficacy of the stuff that we're doing, it, you know, it's going to be different every single time. And so preaching caution, preaching slow, preaching reason. Happiness is outcome divided by expectation. And if we're <laughs> preaching reasonable expectations, it's so much easier for us to do the work that we want to do because we stick with it in a reasonable fashion because we're not disappointed. I, I will never forget, I had a client who, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the day, who literally tapped with me because her husband was just hectoring her so much to shut her husband up. She's like, yeah, I'll go tap with Jean. 15 minutes later, she was disappointed in the lifelong trauma and didn't go away in one round of tapping. Like her expectation changed that quickly. And I was yeah. like, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, it's great that you're now, in, 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 you're invested in all of this. And we got to do this over time. We got to do this in a healthy way. When I teach people, and I, and I just think anybody anybody who's interested in sort of, um, if you feel sort of bitten by the urge to like, I'm going to do some tapping with, you know, my friend and my sister and my da da da, -da take yeah. a workshop. They're everywhere. Like yeah. take, a, take a, a, a workshop that teaches you kind of, basically I think the most fundamental thing is, learn how to handle trauma if it surfaces. You don't have to know how to work with it, but yeah. learn how to box up and and regulate that client and keep them safe. It's not that hard to learn that. And yeah. then that way it's safe for you to maybe, you know, after you had a little bit of training, but you know. Oh, and the thing, the thing that you're saying there is that is not tapping training. That is responding to trauma training. And, and the phrase that I use all the time with my students is, Tapping is not a qualifying tool. If you're not qualified to work with the issue without tapping, just because you know tapping doesn't mean you're qualified to work with the issue. That mm. we need to be qualified to work with an issue in a safe way. And then tapping is an awesome tool to enter into that particular space. And we're just going to keep all of ourselves safer and reasonable expectations. It's just going to make it better for all of us as we try to navigate this wacky transformational landscape this incredibly potent wild west that we're all yeah. having so much fun, you know, Yeah, we're, trying, we're trying to figure out. And, and the really cool thing though, about that particular thing is some of my favorite conversations that I've had in this 24 hours have started exactly like this conversation started. I had this really interesting experience. So I decided, huh, I'm going to try and play around with this thing. And so like, you know, cause I've been in the field for 16 years and I've been interviewing people on my podcast for 14 years. And the insight that I've gotten in the last 24 hours from these conversations is a conversation exactly like this, where it's coming from a place of someone just going, huh, let's, <laughs> let's just follow this interesting thing and see what happens. And in all three cases, there wasn't a, Oh, I'm going to go solve this problem. It's like, that's interesting. I wonder what it is. And because you stepped into it with that sense of curiosity, it made it possible for you not to have preconceived notions and just learn and find your way to something that is now something that will go into my toolbox. That is a really awesome, useful thing. I'm so happy to hear that. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing some tapping with me. I feel so much better. I my just pleasure. Got thank you for letting me thank you for having a, a perfect event to work on and um, awesome excellent demo well, and for doing such you. a great initiative this is fantastic and i can't wait to watch the replays the parts that i've watched already i've learned from so yeah I'm really well but by thursday you'll get an email with all the goodness so you can go back and play along with everybody else fantastic perfect. thanks for your time Naomi. i really appreciate it thank you very much